Well, welcome back. I hope you had a, a great time of discussion. And we're going to look at, uh, in this, this next hour, this next 50 minutes, we're going to look at the necessity of personal holiness biblically and, and also the nature of, of what is holiness. What does the Bible mean when it calls us to be holy? Uh, I want to start, uh, well, actually, let's just review a little bit. We, we saw that salvation uh, is made up of three essential elements. Justification is a, is a past event that happened at the moment you put your trust in Christ. It happened at conversion, and it delivers you from the penalty of sin. Uh, glorification will happen in the future when Christ returns. It will be our complete and final deliverance uh, from sin and from this fallen world. Uh, we will be perfected uh, in spirit. We will be perfected in body. And, and we'll have a new heavens and a new earth, uh, a new creation to, to dwell literally in the presence of God. And in between those two points, the third element of salvation is an ongoing process that is taking place in our lives uh, today as we wait for Christ's return called sanctification. And that is, uh, is a progressive uh, becoming more and more like Christ day by day as we continue in our walk with him. And we made the point that while sanctification, uh, us becoming uh, practically holy, holy in our, in our lives, in the way our lifestyle, that while this is the work of God and is accomplished purely by the grace of God, uh, that we also are called to participate in the process of sanctification, in the process of becoming more like Christ, we're called to actively participate in what God is doing in our lives. Uh, and so we want to look at this necessity of growing in holiness, necessity of becoming more like Christ. Uh, and we want at the outset to again make it clear that growing in personal holiness is not the way of our salvation. It's not the way of salvation. But at the same time, it is uh, growth in holiness, growth in Christ likeness, uh, is an essential expression of our salvation. And it is a mark uh, that the grace of God is, in fact, at work in your life. And so I want to begin by just uh, talking about uh, giving some biblical reasons on why holiness uh, ought to be uh, the, uh, the highest of priority in your life as a Christian and in my life as a Christian, the pursuit of holiness ought to be the highest of our priorities. And first reason is simply because we should pursue holiness because God commands it. The holiness is God's command. And, and we're familiar with these passages. Uh, 1 Peter 1.16, we've already read, where God, uh, uh, through Peter, who quotes from the book of Leviticus, uh, addresses Christians, and God says to believers, professing believers, if you're truly a Christian, then you shall be holy, for I am holy. So God by nature is a holy God. If we are his sons and daughters, then we naturally by nature will, will become holy as well. And, and we want to participate in what God is doing in bringing uh, to fruition uh, holiness in our lives. Uh, another passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, and part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus speaks of life in the kingdom. And he says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, of course, the, he's, he's also making a point here that uh, if you're trying to be perfect to gain salvation, it's not going to work because you can't be. However, the point remains that, that the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom that is to be marked by holiness. And so again, this should motivate us to, to cooperate with the grace of God and the work of God in our lives to pursue holiness as he is working by his grace to produce that holiness in our lives. Uh, another passage is, uh, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses one through three. I've got four three on the oh, on the PowerPoint here, but let me read uh, 
the, the first three verses. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, uh, your growth in holiness. I find it interesting because so often uh, when, when a teacher or a preacher begins to give instructions on, on how you should live your life, what you should do as a Christian, what you should not do as a Christian, uh, sometimes the first response is, well, that's legalism. But you'll notice in this passage, uh, in verses 1 through 3, that Paul specifically says he gave these believers, these new Christians, while he ministered with them. And he was only able to minister with them uh, probably a couple of months before he was run out of town. But in, in those uh, 8 to 12 weeks that Paul was with the Thessalonians, he gave them specific instructions on, on, on practices they, they, they should do and things they should not do as Christians. And it wasn't legalism. Uh, and I think one of your discussion questions is, uh, what, it is, is what is legalism and, and what distinguishes between legalism and, and really uh, legitimate uh, God-given commands that, that we as Christians are in fact to obey in our daily lives. And you can, you can discuss that because legalism certainly is a, a problem in our churches and among believers and we don't want to fall into legalism, but we don't want to go the other way as well and pretend like uh, that God gives no commandments to Christians to obey. And so, uh, so holiness is God's command. Uh, sanctification Becoming more like Christ is, is a process that we should be seeing as believers uh, being worked out in our lives day by day, uh, year by year. So if you're, for instance, a professing Christian, and you've been a Christian, say, three years, and you can look back three years when you first professed to believe in Christ, and your life is no different after the passing of time, uh, you really... Uh, probably have a right and a reason to question uh, whether you truly are uh, a believer or not. Uh, because at some point, in some way, uh, true faith in Jesus Christ will produce change in your life, change in attitude, change in the way you think, and certainly uh, some change, some victory progressively, and not perfection, but progressive growth in the way you live as well. So holiness is God's command. That's the first reason why we should take sanctification, pursuing holiness seriously in our life. Uh, another reason that I think we don't often think of, and I think is a critically important uh, thing to understand, is that our holiness, uh, your holiness as a Christian, uh, that's the purpose for which Jesus Christ died on the cross. We know he died on the cross. We ask, why did Jesus die? Well, to pay our sin penalty. And that's absolutely true. But that's not the only reason Jesus died. And the Bible, the New Testament, makes that crystal clear. Uh, our holiness is the purpose for which Christ died. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, where the apostle writes, You know that he, that Jesus, he appeared to take away sins, and in him is no sin. And notice he didn't say simply to take away the penalty for sin. He appeared, he died on that cross to take away sin itself and, and to conquer the power of sin in our life. That's 1 John 3, verse 5. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. In the same way, um, Paul speaking of marriage, says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So now we're speaking of Jesus and his relationship with the church. Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her on the cross. Why? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So notice it's not simply that Jesus died to deliver us from the penalty of sin, 
but he died that he might sanctify us and make us uh, in our daily lives holy and more and more like Christ each day. Uh, so that's the reason also that Jesus went to the cross. Perhaps uh, maybe the clearest of passages in the New Testament is one we've looked at, at least we looked at the initial part of it, uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And again, it's the Apostle Paul who writes this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, and this grace is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And listen carefully to this part. Jesus, who gave himself for us, for what reason? To redeem us from all lawlessness. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't only die to deliver you and me from hell. And that's the end of it. Jesus died, Scripture clearly states, to redeem us also from sin itself, from lawlessness itself. Jesus died to purify us uh, and to make us zealous for good works. And so uh, never forget that when Jesus died on the cross, he died to make you holy and Muted. deliver you from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. Uh, that's something that has taken me a long time to actually see in Scripture because we so emphasize uh, deliverance from the penalty of sin, and rightly so, but we should also emphasize uh, that he also died on the cross to make us holy to deliver us from sin itself and the power of sin. I think a very practical reason for your life and mine, uh, a very encouraging reason we should pursue holiness, is the, is the, next, uh, the next thing that Scripture says, is that when we pursue holiness, the growth of holiness in our lives, becoming more like Christ progressively in our life, this process of sanctification, this is what gives us evidence of salvation and brings us the assurance of our salvation. Now, so often uh, we, we lead somebody in a prayer to receive Christ, and the first thing we do is start going to Bible verses uh, and that, that give the promise that if you put your trust in Christ, then you are saved. And we try to read those verses and give somebody the assurance of their salvation. And frankly, I think that's out of place. Uh, when you look at what Scripture says about what truly brings assurance of salvation in my life and in your life and in the lives of those you witness to. And what brings assurance of salvation is, with the passing of time, uh, the reality uh, that God is at work bringing sanctification, bringing Christ's likeness to us. When we begin to see... Uh, a power within us, the power of the Holy Spirit, overcoming sin in our lives, that's when assurance really sets in and, and takes hold of us. Uh, now, James says, so also faith by itself, uh, if it does not have works, in other words, if there's no fruit of faith, it's dead. So there could be no assurance of real, at least real assurance, of, of salvation apart from that salvation beginning to produce uh, godliness and good works in our lives. Again, the good works don't gain us salvation, but the good works express a salvation that is real in our hearts. Uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we looked at verses 5 through 7 earlier where, uh, where Peter uh, says that based on God giving us a share of his divine nature, that we are then to respond to God's grace in our lives by making every effort 
to add to our faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love that we are to, to strive with God uh, to add those things, to grow, to be sanctified in our life. And having said that, in verse 9, Peter goes on, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice uh, these qualities, you will, well, you will never fall. So here again, the Apostle Peter very clearly ties our sense of assurance, our making our calling and our election sure, is how he puts it, that our sense of assurance is directly tied to our pursuit of holiness, our pursuit of Christ-likeness in our lives. So as we see that growth beginning to take place, that's where assurance of salvation comes. And then 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 3. Again, the Apostle John, uh, James has said it, Peter has said it, and now John says it. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. By this, we have assurance, if we keep his commandments. Because only those who have the Holy Spirit within them first have the desire to keep his commandments and, and begin to find the power to keep his commandments. So the presence of God's Spirit, the experience of growing in holiness, is where assurance of our salvation comes from. And, and I think that's important to keep in mind, even in our evangelism and in our counseling of people, uh, when people come and say, I'm not sure if I'm saved, um, I, I think the point you need to bring up is, are you seeing growth in your life? Are you seeing uh, a progressive development of, of more Christ-likeness in your life? And I think most often when someone asks that question, uh, that's a pretty good sign uh, that they probably are believers because most people who don't have the Holy Spirit don't worry much about it. Uh, okay, so holiness should be important. The pursuit of holiness should be important to us because holiness is God's command. Uh, it should be important to us because uh, holiness is the purpose for which Christ died. And on a very practical level, holiness is what brings us uh, assurance of our salvation. When we see uh, that we have a new power, a new desire to overcome sin, and a new power to overcome sin, that reveals the presence of God's Spirit in our hearts and lives. Uh, another reason that holiness should, should be a priority in our life is holiness prepares us for our life in heaven. If you really believe you're going to heaven, you, you want to start making preparations for that eternal life right now. Now, Hebrews 12.14, uh, we've already uh, introduced tonight with this verse. But again, the writer of Hebrews says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And of course, he's talking about seeing the Lord at the second coming uh, face to face and being uh, in his presence forever in heaven. Also, 2 Peter, again, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 14, we read this. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, uh, the things of this world, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot, or blemish. If you believe in the second coming of Christ, if you believe that this world is passing away, if you look towards heaven and you're living for heaven, uh, you will be preparing yourself for heaven. And heaven is a place, Peter says, where only righteousness dwells. 
uh, another passage, Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, where uh, the Apostle John writes, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, will ever enter heaven. He's describing heaven in this chapter. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So again, uh, it, to be written in the Lamb's book of life is to be justified and connected with justification Again, a sanctification it is a progressive growth in holiness. And to prepare for heaven, then, uh, a place where there is no sin, then we must be struggling and cooperating with God to overcome the sin in our own lives. And then finally, Revelation chapter 28. Uh, Revelation chapter 28, verses 10 and 11, where again John says, And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evil doer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. What that really is expressing to us is that the character that you possess, the character that you are developing in your life today, is the character that you will take into eternity. And those who have no interest in righteousness today in this life uh, really have no share in the righteousness uh, that will be found in heaven. And so if you have no interest, if those you minister to seem to have no interest in righteousness, uh, then they are likely not truly born again. They are likely not yet on their way to heaven and probably need to be ministered to as you would minister to an unbeliever. So again, the character you are developing today is a character you take with you into eternity. So holiness uh, and the pursuit of holiness prepares you for heaven. And then uh, finally, holiness the pursuit of holiness is very, very essential in our own ministry as Christians. Uh, so whatever ministry you're engaged in uh, is not simply a matter of passing information on to people. Uh, what you do, what you teach is critically important, but also how you live is just as important to effective ministry. And this is what uh, we learn in the New Testament. Uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, and also verse 16. There the Apostle Paul writes a young pastor named Timothy, and he counsels him, he mentors him with these words. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And notice how Paul connects not just what we say, what we teach, or what we do in ministry, but how he connects that to the life that we live as ministers. And so uh, ministry is not uh, simply about teaching something. It's also about living the truth, not just teaching the truth. And so those who you mentor uh, will learn as much or more from your own example uh, as they will from uh, the biblical teaching that you provide to them. Both are essential. Both go together. Also, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, uh, the Apostle Peter speaks to elders specifically, and he says to the elders, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. 
So again, uh, the Apostle Peter speaks to elders, speaks to ministers, and he says to them, uh, you minister by leading by example. So your lifestyle is critical to your ministry. And then finally, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, so the teaching ministry. But he says, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. That's Hebrews 13, 7. So again, ministry has to be more than simply some kind of an information dump. Uh, ministry means that you share your life in Christ, your own walk with Christ, with others. Ministry means that you walk with others as you walk with Jesus. And that those you mentor, those you teach, those you minister to can see the reality and the application of biblical truth and what that looks like in life by seeing how you apply biblical truth to your own life. So holiness is essential to ministry. And um, Ian Bounds had uh, much to say about that. He has a, a little book that he wrote. Ian Bounds was a Civil War chaplain. There's a little book that he wrote called Power Through Prayer. And uh, it's actually written uh, to pastors. And he, he makes this statement in that book. He, he says, uh, we are continually, as, as ministers, we are continually striving to create new methods, plans, and organizations to advance the church. We are ever working to provide and stimulate growth and efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man, of the pastor. God's plan is to make much of the man far more of him than anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. And how relevant that, that, uh, that statement is. He made that statement uh, more than 100 years ago. And it's just as relevant today as, as we so often uh, get caught up in our methods, in our programs, in the way we organize. And those things are, are not unimportant, but they're less important than the character of the minister himself. And so God is looking for better men. God is looking for servants who are pursuing holiness in such a way that God can use them in the lives of others. And so uh, holiness is God's command. Holiness is the purpose for which Christ died. Holiness gives evidence of salvation. It brings assurance to us. And holiness prepares us for heaven. And holiness, again, is essential for ministry. Uh, which brings us to, okay, what is exactly this holiness that the Bible calls us to as Christians, as servants, as ministers? Uh, it's important that we understand what what biblical holiness, what sanctification is going to look like as it takes place in our life. And the first thing we have to be very crystal clear on is that holiness is not, uh, it's not outward obedience to a list of do's and don'ts. Now here again we're, we're talking about the danger of legalism. But Jesus makes it clear that the kind of holiness he is calling true Christians to is not obedience to a list of rules. And he makes that clear when he speaks uh, to and about the Pharisees of his day. And again, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 22, and also verses 27 through 28. There Jesus says, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. You have heard that it was said, 
you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And, and so what, what's Jesus saying there? Uh, first of all, he says your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. But if you read through, of course, the Gospels, you discover that the scribes and Pharisees were all about outward obedience to a list of, of, of long list of rules, ridiculously long list, list of rules, and, and nothing about really the condition of a person's heart. And so where Jesus talks about murder, he talks about adultery, he makes it clear to us that the issue is, has more to do with outward actions. It has to do with the condition of your heart. So the kind of holiness that God looks for, the kind of holiness that God produces uh, when we believe in Christ is a holiness of a transformed heart, a holiness of, of inward motivations rather than of outward obedience to a list of rules and laws. And so that is one uh, distinguishing point between legalism and true holiness that God calls us to in Christ. The other thing we need to understand is uh, not only can holiness not be defined by outward obedience to a list of rules, uh, we also need to make clear that when we talk about a holy life and the holiness that God produces in us in this process of sanctification, that a holy life for you and me in this world is not a life of perfection. Uh, never think that God is demanding, uh, well, he demands that we strive for perfection, but a standard of judgment for us as believers is not perfection because he tells us up front that in this world we cannot attain perfection. We see that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, there uh, the Apostle John says, if we say we have no sin, if now he's, he's writing to Christians here. So if you as a Christian say, well, I have no sin, I'm perfect, then John says, actually, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. So right up front, we understand that the holiness that God is calling us to in this world, while we strive for perfection, the moment we say we have reached perfection is the moment we fall into sin. Uh, so, so this holy life ultimately is in this world is not going to be a life marked by perfection. But what is then holiness and, and the sanctification that God is calling us to? Uh, let's look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 12 and verse 15. Again, we've read this, but let's read this again. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And then notice what he says in verse 15. Practice these things, Timothy. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your perfection. Not at all. He says devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. And I think that's a very significant distinction. In this world, uh, between the time we are justified and the time that Christ comes to glorify us, the holiness God seeks, the holiness that will be expressed in your life and mine if we are being sanctified by God's Spirit, is not a holiness of perfection, but is a holiness of ongoing progress, of, of an ongoing pattern uh, over the long haul of becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what we need to look for in our life, is a continual growth. We never uh, reach perfection in this life. We should, there, there's always more growth that can happen in our life, and that's what we should seek in this process of sanctification. Continual progress, continual mature, continuing maturity, um, a continuing growth in Jesus Christ. That's the holy life that God calls us to in this world. Uh, so don't ever be burdened down by the idea that somehow you have to be perfect, but you do need to be growing if, if you're 
if your walk with Jesus is healthy. So what is a holy life? It's, it's not a life uh, that is governed by a list of rules, external rules. Uh, it is not a life that's going to attain perfection in this world. That happens when Jesus comes again. And next, uh, we are told in Scripture that a holy life is, is a life of growing conformity to God's character. A holy life is a life of growing conformity to the character of God himself. And that's why we began this study by looking at the holiness of God. Now, again, 1 Peter 1.15 tells us this. It says, uh, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Uh, and so... Our lives are transformed uh, as the Holy Spirit himself works in our heart, conforming us to his own holiness, to the holiness of God, a transformed heart. Again, motivation, uh, what happens inside our life and our heart, far more important than, than an attempt, again, to keep a list of rules. A holy life, finally, uh, we talked about the definition of holiness right up front as being uh, holiness is the idea of being set apart. So a holy life for you and, and me as believers is a set apart life in Christ. Uh, God calls us to himself in Jesus to live for him uh, and to be transformed by him rather than to be transformed and conformed to the world. We see that in Romans chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2. There Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Romans 1, again, 12, verses 1 and 2. So again, the holy life is a set-apart life, and by being set-apart, I mean by being set apart from the patterns and the thinkings uh, of this world, of this fallen world. Uh, Jerry Bridges, uh, in his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, if you've not read that book, it's, an, it's a very good book, very helpful book, uh, on spiritual disciplines and on growth and the pursuit of holiness and I would recommend it to you but in that book uh, Jerry Bridges writes uh, to live a holy life is to live a life in conformity to the moral precepts of the Bible and in contrast in contrast to the sinful ways of this world and so uh, hopefully that helps you understand uh, what really it means when the Bible calls a Christian to holiness. This process of sanctification, an ongoing process, again, not to perfection in this life, but an ongoing process that will demonstrate itself in continuing progress in our walk with Christ, uh, a continuing and growing victory over sin in our life. And, and I'd like, that's, that's really, uh, I think we'll end uh, 10 minutes early, uh, but I hope this has been helpful to you. And I hope you understand the importance of this whole process of sanctification, uh, the importance of pursuing and cooperating with God in, in, this, in this grace of sanctification that He's working out in our lives. And next Tuesday, what we'll do is we'll look at uh, some of the pathways to that sanctification through spiritual disciplines, like prayer, like meditating on God's Word, studying God's Word, uh, solitude, other spiritual disciplines that God gives us to help us uh, in this process of becoming more and more like Christ. Uh, let's pray together.
Father, I do pray that as we have really simply sat down and, and together and, and looked at your word and looked at what, at least some of what you have said, first about your holiness and then about the importance of us becoming holy, growing in holiness as your children, and the importance of holiness in bringing us assurance of salvation and in making us useful to you as we seek to minister in the lives of others. Implant in our hearts, even now, we ask, a hunger to become more like Christ. Lord, you have said that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you have given us a spirit of discipline. And that spirit of discipline enables us, Lord, to pursue you and to become more like Christ. And we pray that this would be our passion. Give us confidence in what you are doing in our lives and help us to keep in step with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.